I'm just going to set the scene. Obviously, this is an event organised by the Friends of Wellerbrook Park with the South Yorkshire Biodiversity Research Group and supported by the National Lottery Community Fund, Together for Our Planet, and a local business sponsor, very generously supporting the workshops. So, I'm going to talk... Oh, very good, the lights. Excellent. Um, I'm going to talk about climate crisis and extreme weather events and just set the scene. The first thing to say is that there is a super little book by my former colleague, uh, the late Gaynor Boone, who used to run the Met Station, the weather station at Western Park, which I believe is one of the longest running, continually running weather stations in the country. And she and uh, Adrian Middleton produced a really nice sort of summary published by Sorby Natural History Society called Sheffield's Weather. And I checked this morning, there are two copies on Amazon, one for seven pounds, plus PMP and one for eight pounds. Okay. So, and it's like, it says in, <laughs> it's like it says in little, when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> so if you do want a copy, that is a really good book to get. So I want to set the scene and talk about some of the reasons why we're doing this, why we are here. And we have various scenarios, and a lot of this is kind of couched in terms of, well, how much do we really know? I tend to be a little bit cynical and sceptical about some things, but if we take the the accepted uh, way of looking at climate, there are problems in terms of future climates that we don't actually know what's going to happen. And there are different scenarios, which I might mention. But we've got different futures that lie ahead. It might be one and a half degrees, might be two degrees, might be really hot, it might be three degrees increase. These are figures that people uh, are banding around. Today we have a half day workshop Looking at the group's own weather station, which is here, and we're going to talk about that, and Peter is the authority on do-it-yourself weather stations, Peter Smithson, used to be a uh, senior lecturer at Sheffield University, and knows far more about climate than I do, so I feel slightly nervous about this. Myself, and then Kevin, who is hiding away in the corner, he's probably finishing his presentation, oh. uh, and you have met him at the launch, <laughs> who will be talking about the implications of climate, what we're doing in terms of measuring and assessing uh, water runoff, the work we're doing with Sheffield Rotherham Wildlife Trust on slowing the flow with the Friends Group. Um, and he'll be talking about how the weather data fits into the models that we're using, and Peter will then be talking about actually what it means to record local weather data. So, as it says, we're not at St John the Evangelist Church Hall, um, we're in the Hammer and Pincers, thank you. <laughs> this is the programme, myself doing an introduction, uh, Kevin talking about measuring the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events, so it's the sort of uh, stream flow and linking the, the rain uh, coming in into what it means on the ground in terms of water running off. And then Peter took out recording and monitoring weather at a local level with a, a weather station and we've got one to demonstrate. And you have one in your own garden, don't you? Yes, yes, I've got first garden, but if we can pop it on there eventually, see. I thought we'd leave it in the box. <laughs> so, just to whip through some things, so we've got some common ground because I, I realise that we use these terms a lot but not everybody will be totally familiar. <coughs> So climate is the average weather given in a given area over a longish period of time. Um, it generally includes things like uh, temperature in different seasons, rainfall, sunshine, etc. And the possibility of extreme weather is also often included within accounts of climate. Commonly measured meteorological variables are things like temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind and precipitation. In a broader sense, climate is the state of the components of the climate system, including the ocean, the land, and the extent of ice on Earth. So climate change. Climate change is a systematic change in long-term climate variables like temperature, precipitation, pressure, or wind. It's sustained over several decades or longer, often at least about 30 years or so, um, and not clearly often much longer periods than that. Climate change can be due to natural external forcing. This tends to get missed out in discussions about current climate issues, but there may be changes 
that actually make the climate flux. So things like these call it natural external forcing, change in solar emission, changes in the Earth's orbit, natural internal processes of the climate system, or of course human induced. And this is one that we are really concerned about at the moment. So, cause of climate change. Evidence is that the main cause of current climate change is burning fossil fuels such as oil, gas and coal. I could throw peat in there, but I have an interest in peat and peat use. I um, might mention that if I get time later. Burn fossil fuels release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, causing the planet to heat up. So fossil fuels are things that have been laid down through historic capture of uh, solar energy, laid down long term, sometimes over millions of years, sometimes over thousands of years. But we basically exploit that and in releasing the energy, release carbon as a greenhouse gas. So what causes climate change? Well, one of the things that, again, people tend to forget, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Not many of us remember that. Uh, and the climate has changed considerably over that period. So climate tends to flux, tends to change. The key thing really is that until relatively recently, natural factors were the cause. And this might include volcanic eruptions, changes in the Earth's orbit, shifts in the Earth's crust, plate tectonics. Um, volcanic eruptions. There were ones in the 1700s, I think it was, that dropped the temperature across Europe for several years. Uh, prehistoric uh, volcanoes caused drops in the Earth's temperature globally, which caused the abandonment of upland landscapes across the planet. You can see that the, the uh, settlement patterns of humans on the planet suddenly en masse abandoned certain peripheral areas and particularly high altitude areas because the climate's changed and it's no longer tenable to live there. So we have to bear these things in mind. Also, over millions of years, Earth experienced, has experienced a series of ice ages, including cooler periods, glacials, and warmer periods, interglacials. And of course, one of the things that we hear about now is worry about the uh, breakup of the Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets. Glacial and interglacial periods cycle roughly every 100,000 years, caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. There may be other factors involved in that. For the past few thousand years, Earth has been in an interglacial period with reasonably constant temperature. It's full of weasel words, reasonably. However, what is quite clear is that since the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s and 1800s, kicking off mainly in Western Europe and then spreading around the globe, global temperatures increased at a much faster rate. We had a presentation by David Bellamy, who actually was a climate change denier, or at least a carbon denier. Um, and one of the things that he did show was that uh, temperature rose before some of the carbon measures show an increase in carbon, which he said was, mm, that was an interesting question. Sadly, David is no longer with us, and I don't think we even kept a copy of his presentation, did we? So one of the after dinner no, talk. No, no. No, that, but it's an interesting a point. You know, you can correlate different data sets and come to different interpretations. But by burning fossil fuels and changing land use, human activity has become the leading cause of climate change. And there are two things there: fossil fuels, but also land use. And one of the arguments about climate change is that carbon is perhaps too simple; that the things are much more sophisticated and subtle and inter interrelated that. Land use is a big issue. One of the questions, and this is something again that David Bellamy raised, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but he said, well, if you increase carbon and you increase temperature, plants should photosynthesize faster and the things should go back into a homostatic balance. And his question is, why is that not happening? And his answer is, it's because you've drained the wetlands, you've cleared the rainforest, uh, temperate and tropical, and you basically knackered the oceans by polluting them. So that is a big issue. The planet has a degree of homeostatic mechanism, and that is one of the things which has, at the moment, it's in the process of crashing. And we have to ask, well, why is that? And 
why do we not do something about it? And the reason we don't do something about it is it's too intractable politically. Changing in land use is fundamental. I mean, we are trapped in a situation now where we're talking about local communities battling climate change, enhancing biodiversity, doing this, that and the other. At the same time, I'm inundated with groups across the country whose local green spaces are under threat because we're building on them. And you really can't have it both ways. You've got to make your mind up. So, anyway, scientists have recorded five significant ice ages during Earth's history, uh, and we are in the last one, the quaternary, from about 2.6 million years ago to the present time. And we can follow the, the warm interglacials and the cold glacials. And there are some issues about the speed with which they can tip between glacial and interglacial. So an interglacial is a warm period, the glacial is a really cold period. Um, and when you think about in Siberia, they have found mammoths stood up in the permafrost in the ice eating grass. That doesn't suggest it snowed a bit this year and a bit more next year, it suggests it snowed a hell of a lot very suddenly to overwhelm animals like that. So there are all sorts of issues, and some of these changes are very rapid in a geological sense. So we need to think about what the implications of some of those are uh, and what is actually driving these cycles. That's where some of the debates come in. Greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. Some of the gases in the Earth's atmosphere trap heat and stop it escaping back into space. These are what we call greenhouse gases. These act as a warming blanket around the Earth, giving the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases come from both human and natural sources, things like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, etc., which occur naturally. Is water vapor greenhouse gas as well? It should be. Yes. It's yeah. very yeah. effective. Yeah, it's often well, it's the not, most effective one. Yeah, yeah it's not often not it's an anti, mentioned. Yeah, an anti greenhouse. Okay. So others, such as chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, are only produced by human activity. So if you find those increasing, you know that's to do with human activity. When shortwave solar radiation reaches the Earth, most of it passes through the atmosphere to hit the surface. The Earth absorbs most of its radiation and gives off longer wavelength infrared radiation. Same thing that happens in your greenhouse. Um, and that gives you the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases absorb some of the infrared radiation which is reflected back and instead of passing it, well radiated back, instead of passing it back into outer space. The atmosphere then emits radiation in all directions, sending some of it back to the surface, causing the planet to heat up. So it's kind of coming through, being re-radiated as uh, infrared, or red uh, end of the spectrum, and that's then absorbed in the atmosphere, and some of it's radiated out, some of it's radiated back. But the net thing is uh, an increase, potentially, in the Earth's temperature, process is known as the greenhouse effect. And it's not all bad news, this is the other thing. People talk about the greenhouse effect, it's very difficult, but it's actually critical to life. If we hadn't got the greenhouse effect, the planet would be about 30 degrees colder. Now we've just been sitting in the car park, I came unprepared for standing in the car park, it was quite cold. 30 degrees colder, I would be very, very cold indeed. So without greenhouse gas warming effect, we would not survive. So it isn't all bad news, but it's a matter of balance. Human impacts, this is the exciting bit. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've added more and more greenhouse gases into the air, trapping even more heat. There's a paper on our website, the UK Econet, which also talks about pre-industrial use of peat and the drainage of peat box, which we now believe was far more significant than has previously been thought. And that actually releases colossal amounts of pre-industrial carbon and could go some way to explain some of those early changes. Instead of keeping the Earth warm at a, uh, stable, at a warm, stable temperature, the greenhouse effect heats the planet much faster because we're pumping these gases in, so more of the heat is being trapped and re-radiated back down to the surface. We call this the enhanced greenhouse effect, and that's the main cause of current climate change. And that's, that's the one that we need to worry about, it's the enhanced greenhouse effect. So we produce greenhouse gases in many different ways. So I'll just a quick think about causes of climate change. 
um, releasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. There's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there has been in at least the past two million years. During the 20th and 21st century, the level of carbon dioxide rose by about 40%. It's still quite a minor gas in the atmosphere, and there are other things that kick into this. And of course, during the Carboniferous period, which is when the coal measures and uh, other deposits were laid down, carbon dioxide was quite high in the atmosphere, hence the massive plant growth and the carbon capture. Oops. So, producing greenhouse gases in many different ways. The presentation will be upon the website, by the way, so don't worry too much about mm -hmm. capturing all this. Burning fossil fuels, deforestation, agriculture, and cement. Mm -hmm. Concrete making releases huge amounts of carbon dioxide. Um, and there are issues. I mean, you can also, in terms of going carbon neutral, I've got colleagues who are working on housing where you have large blocks of concrete to hold heat and make the properties more heat efficient. And they say, well, okay, when we make the concrete, it's giving off carbon dioxide now, but if the lifespan of our properties is 200 years, then over that period, you more than compensate for anything you've given off. I'm not, I'm, yeah, it's not thinking about that. Concrete. No. <laughs> in fact, it's much better to use water. Yeah. Very much smaller yeah. volume of water will hold the heat. Yeah. So, agriculture, all sorts of issues here. Um, oh, well, there's this thing about animals producing methane because they um, eat the vegetation, the bacteria in their stomachs, like cows, gives off methane. Um, but we had that farmer present at our rewilding the soil conference who said, well, actually, when you look at what happens in detail, it's only, that's only a problem if you're feeding them the wrong diet. And if you actually get the diet right, I think they fart a little less. I think it's probably along those lines. It's the belching. Yeah, it's the belching, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you have a little bit of seaweed from the Filey uh, seaweed farm, mm. uh, almost, you know, almost yeah. immediately better. So you've got issues like that. You've also got things like, you know, a huge proportion of the world dependent on rice, a lot of rice, not all rice, but a lot of rice is grown in paddy fields. Paddy fields tend to give off things like methane and the like. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, but present in small quantities. So, as I say, there are lots of issues about, you know, debating what's actually going on. Deforestation is a massive thing. And there is a, a myth at the moment in some areas about Oh, it's okay. The planet is, you know, the planet is reforesting, and what you're seeing is scrub developing on abandoned traditional farmland, possibly going back many centuries. But we're still eating away at primary uh, forest in Indonesia, in Africa, uh, in the Amazon, etc. And it's not like for like. And of course, Ronald Reagan famously said that forests give off more carbon dioxide than, yeah. He said the trees were bad for climate, I think. <laughs> natural changes in climate. Many, ch many natural changes, which we forget about. Natural cycles alternating between warming and cooling. These are known as forcings, which then force climate to change. And they contribute to climate change, but they're not the, presently the, the primary cause. The leading cause of current climate change is human activity, release of greenhouse gases, and as I say, the fact that the, the planetary ecosystem is no longer able to uh, fulfil its homeostatic functions. And part of the, and there are big arguments, people have written papers about um, how it may not be anthropogenic drivers, it may be natural forcing, such as the planetary path around the sun, which is not uniform, so as we move over periods closer and further away in that effects amount of heat energy coming through. And also, um, the Earth is on a, a tilt, and the tilt wobbles a bit. So this just all makes it really quite complicated. The Milankovitch cycles, um, as the Earth travels around the Sun, its path and its axis can tilt slightly, and we can track this by climatologists can track this over periods of time. But these probably don't affect what we're seeing today. 
you can argue about that, but it probably doesn't actually have that great impact. And there are other things which you'll read about in the media and see in the media, things like the El Nino, the Pacific uh, oscillations, uh, linking to Pacific Ocean water temperatures, and those can have massive effects in the short term on uh, weather and climate in certainly in the southern hemisphere and you know further afield as well. But that's not what we're looking at. That's not the the main driver at the moment. It's on top of all that. So natural forcings can contribute to climate change. So anything that affects the amount of sunlight uh, hitting the planet will actually have an impact on uh, temperature. But they will probably make the entire atmosphere warmer, for example, if you increase solar energy, whereas what we're seeing is warming in the lower layers. So that's where you get the sort of worrying tendencies. Volcanic eruptions. You see a volcano going up and, you know, oh, just look at that. How can human activity be more significant than that and volcanoes can have a short-term impact but actually you know they produce 50 times less carbon dioxide than do humans so they, again they're not the leading cause of change and also what volcanoes have done historically because of all the dust and volcanic eruptions vary depending on what type of eruption it is what kind of vol volcano it is what they throw out does vary considerably um, but they throw out lots and lots of ash and other material which then reflects sunlight back into the um, back into space and they have a cooling effect and we see that when there as I say when there have been massive volcanic eruptions you know like Krakatoa and like some of the earlier ones uh, they actually drop planetary temperatures and you know we know people starve as a consequence there's a two-year period where supposedly the temperature in Scotland, I can't remember, Peter will probably know, but it's, I think it's the late 1600s or 1700s, and planetary temperatures. The temperature in Scotland didn't get above zero for two years, isn't it? I mean, Scotland is cold, but it's not normally that cold. A year without a summer, it was cold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thoroughly depressing time. Yeah. Yeah. Young people were starving across Europe. Uh, you see some of these changes. We also had the Little Ice Age, which isn't an ice age, it's just a very cold period. Um, and people across Europe got smaller, they starved. So we see those sort of things happening. But again, that is not, you know, that has a massive effect for a time, but it's not the thing which is actually causing the long term flux. So we then thrown back on the question, you know, are people responsible for climate change? And basically, <clears throat> The overwhelming, there are still people that will debate this, debate this, but the overwhelming consensus is that humans are the leading cause of climate change and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated this unequivocally. Natural cycles can change the temperature of the Earth, but not at the scale and the speed witnessed. And many things affect climate change, so but there is irrefutable evidence that burning fossil fuels and changing land use are the primary causes. And the one that I worry about the most, and that fossil fuels is a, is a biggie, but also changing land use, and we just do not address that because that's too uncomfortable. It's what um, some people would describe as an inconvenient truth. You say that uh, urbanisation and the use of concrete in building. Yeah. Bigger, they have, they have an impact. Than Not necessarily bigger, but they are a contributor to it. Yeah. And, and you've got two around. things. One is that you're urbanising in you concrete. Yeah. You also exacerbate the impacts, the adverse impacts of extreme weather and climate issues. And you're contributing to carbon release, and you're compromising the ability of the landscape to absorb carbon. So it's kind of a lot of different things, and it's very you can't easily tease out any of them. And that's part of the problem. So what are the impacts? Well, you know, we know that the ice sheets are breaking up. We know there's an unprecedented uh, retreat of glaciers, etc. We have dysfunctional ecology. I should have taught that as a module. That would be yeah. good. <laughs> dysfunctional ecology. First years. Breakdown of food chains, food webs, and seasonal cycles, interdependencies. Things get out of kilter. So there's a thing called phenology. Um, and it means that basically blue ticks, for example, and great ticks have evolved to have their young 
at the peak time of release of winter moth caterpillars on oak trees, if the winter moth caterpillars are delayed or are early or whatever, the thing may get out of kilter and then birds may starve. It's as simple as that. If things flower at the wrong time, their pollinating insects may not be available at the right time. So things start to break down, to fall apart. And the other thing, when this is one of the drivers at the moment of the, the huge problems we've got in woodland management and tree management, pests and diseases. You know, you're changing climate, you're suddenly getting more pests and diseases. But that is combined with globalization. So you're getting things moving around anyway, and then things that arrive and then we can thrive here. Whereas when you had normal weather, they didn't. So you get changes in distribution and abundance, and we may sometimes feel very uncomfortable with that. We need to recognize that in terms of ecology, in terms of future ecology, we are dealing with what we call recombinant ecologies in future scapes. Things are changing. You are getting native and non-native species forming new communities. And again, conservation, you know, people feel very uncomfortable about that. We have both invasive species and we have extinctions as a consequence of all these changes. Crops become very, very problematic. And we have some big issues about what we might grow and what we can't grow. Fisheries, which I'm not really mentioning here, also change catastrophically because of shifts in warm and cold water. So we get things moving around. Um, what I don't mention in this is the, the North Atlantic drift, the Gulf Stream. Because if the ice actually melts and pushes cold water further south and pushes the Gulf Stream further south, we may not actually get warmer. We may get colder, much, much colder. We end up being like Moscow. But well, that's local. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, invasive species, dysfunctional ecology, things out of kilter, things that are not tiny. Um, I've got parakeets in my garden, I quite like them, actually. <laughs> so, extreme weather and consequences flood, drought, storms, extreme heat, extreme cold. These are all part of this imbalance. And what we are getting, you know, people might argue about aspects of climate change and causes, but what we are clearly getting is more extreme weather more frequently. And we see this not just here, but around the world. We see, you know, catastrophic events. Um, and all those are bad news. That doesn't mean these, these never happened before. If you read history, there have always been catastrophic floods and droughts and storms and extreme heat and extreme cold, but we're getting them more and more frequently. You know, we had the floods in Sheffield 2007, and we said, oh, it's a one in 500 or something. And, uh, well, and then it happens again a few years later, it happens again a few years after that. They are happening more frequently. And we also have associated problems like soil degradation and erosion, which is what we covered in our rewilding the soil conference. So you're getting droughts which change the soil and change the soil uh, biology, and then you get storms and floods, and that will wash the soil away, causing more pollution in the rivers, causing more pollution in the seas and oceans. So all these combine, and, and it's a big issue locally. This is, this is Sheffield 2007. You know, that is on our doorstep, that is what we are facing, and it's gonna get bigger and better. Yeah, these are serious issues in terms of um, human adaptation to sharing this planet with the rest of its ecology. There are also social and humanitarian issues, and these are likely to increase with social and economic imbalance and associated unrest. Globally significant deep displacement of communities, which we are witnessing. Yeah, I know some of these are due to conflicts, but some of them are simply due to uh, land resources and land use and the need to survive. There are huge economic implications. And these are disproportionately spread around the globe. And they cause huge suffering, starvation, degradation of land, inability of communities to support themselves. And there's a lot of concern about this, so people are lobbying about those sort of issues. It's not all negative, there are opportunities for change as well which we need to think about. But one of the difficulties at the moment is that it's huge and it's unpredictable. We don't really know what's going to happen and we don't know when it's going to happen or where it's going to happen. From extreme weather to food supply, water supply, 
if you're in a country where you're running out of water, you're not going to hang around. If you can help it, you, you move next door and take what water you can. You know, people become desperate for resources. Um, disease, displacement, damage to infrastructure, health costs, etc. When we have these storms, you're looking at billions of pounds of damage. So we need to think about that and we need to think about uh, what we need to do. Adaptation and mitigation. Now this is the chef who went to go. So I, I like seeing this as a very useful off-channel storage of uh, flood water. So very appropriate, I think. But there are opportunities. Um, you know, we need to think how, you know, how are we generating energy? How are we generating clean energy? Um, and that is now complicated by the whole issue of um, political unrest and who is supplying what to whom. So there's a whole set of things which are kicking in in terms of energy supply and resource supply. So it's, again, it's not a simple issue, but there are things that we can do and there are opportunities, and some of these are business opportunities. Just to quickly round up, what are the local and regional responses? Well, it's the Ocean Humber Climate Commission. So areas have got commission set up with targets of net zero for carbon, well, targets for developing resilience and developing what we call a just transition to a new situations. The situation is changing whether we like it or not. It's a little bit like my invasive species thing. The genie is out of the bottle and it's not going back in. Even if you assume, oh, I don't like non-native species, well, you're going to have to get used to it because they're here. I think that nature recovery, and this is where you know there's some harsh decisions because you can't argue that we're looking at nature recovery if you're still, on the one hand, destroying nature. So that is something that we need to think about very, very carefully. Um, and there's a lot of double speak at the moment, but I'm kind of biased on that. Thirty commissioners for the region plus meetings and panels. Research and development, future economy movement to net zero, and there are policy drivers, both from above and within, that we need to be looking at. So these address issues of land, water, nature and food, land use and economy, and community and nature recovery. And these are in the context of expected or predicted scenarios. So warmer temperatures, drier summers, wetter winters, heavier rainfall during storms, which I think we do witness. I mean, when it rains, it really rains. And you know, the BBC will say, oh, light showers. <laughs> that's not a light shower, that's a torrential downpour. Um, increased extreme weather events, increased flooding, species changes, new pests and diseases. There is also a danger with this that, as an environmentalist, you can be in the position of bearing bad tidings and people get very depressed. Lots of kids are thoroughly depressed and worried, really worried about things like flooding and biodiversity extinction and climate change. So you need to also offer up some positive things that you can do. But there's increased uncertainty, the risk to people in nature um, and we are going to be living in a much changed world. So we need to look for things that we can positively bring to the table and say, okay, you can take action, you can do this. So mitigation and adaptation. So tackling the causes, reducing emissions, capturing carbon. Hugely important. But also dealing with the effects. Resilience. Accommodating changes and accepting transformations. You know, I know Canute didn't really believe he could turn the tide back. He was actually telling his advisors that they were fools for saying that he was hoping that he could turn the tide back. But a bit like Canute, he can't sit there on the beach and say, stop, it's not going to happen. So we need to think more effectively about how we deal with this. So local responses and local actions, and this is where our project comes in. We need to think global and act local. One or two politicians tend to think local and act global, but that's a different matter. Um, so we talk about community action, managing change, thinking about assessing situations, evaluating, adapting, monitoring, reviewing, and then implementing changes where we can. And we aim to build resilience to manage change, underpinned by effective ways of working, 
in the context of some key challenges, it suggests that we will see a 21% decrease in summer rainfall. That can cause huge stress for farming in our breadbasket landscapes. They're already meteorologically dry in many areas. The east coast, sort of east side of England, the Fenlands, um, and you cut their water supply even more and they have problems. But also an increase in winter rainfall and there is sort of seasonal changes versus overall changes, so we need to think about how we deal with that. There are issues of health and lifestyle and challenges for that. So we need to think about taking responsibility, about community action, about community champions, which again is part of what the project is about. Growing people's skills and confidence so they can take action, but also they can take message out to a wider community, so the wider community can take action. Sharing messages and experiences, networking and empowering local people, and showcasing positive actions, which is, again is where the project comes in, because we'd like to see people coming into the park to find out about how the group are taking action themselves to deal with these things. So think, lo think global, act local. Thank you. That. Think globally and act locally in English. I think that's it. <laughs> Am I on <out> time? <laughs>
But if you decide on particular intervals, then you can count out the number of tips that occurred in a, in a particular time interval. The EEA generally has about 15 minutes, but you can vary it as you, as you want to. If it's, uh, if it's too long though, then essentially what you're doing is, is that you're getting like daily rainfall or monthly rainfall or yearly rainfall. So that, that information is useful, but then you lose uh, information about what's happening for a particular storm. Okay, so we've talked about rainfall depth. So the thing to visualize is that if you put a, a cup out in your garden or a bucket or a, a bathtub, what you'll find is that even though the area changes, if you went out with a ruler, you'd find that there'd be exactly the same depth of water in each of those three containers. Okay, so that's why rainfall depth is, is important. The next thing that is useful is rainfall intensity. So we all know the difference between an intense rainfall or a drizzle or a, a misty wetness, okay? And that is your rainfall depth divided by the duration over which that rainfall fell. So that's what we mean by rainfall intensity. And the usual rain, uh, units of that is millimeters per hour, okay? So if we chose a five minute duration uh, that we were counting tips over, you would, let's say that we had like 10 tips, that would be two millimeters of rainfall that fell, and then we would divide it by uh, the unit of five minutes in hours to give you what the rainfall intensity is. So that's how that works. Okay, so what you can do when you're thinking about uh, flow in a, uh, or the hydrology of a particular catchment is that you, you want to have as many gauges as you have uh, that you can in a catchment. Obviously this is, is reasonably time consuming. Um, this dot, this, um, sorry, this triangle here is where uh, the Abideo model railway is and I'm guessing that your uh, rain gauge is going to be in, in Merlo and the hall somewhere, I don't know, we shall wait and see. Um, and then you've got EA gauges, uh, that your component gauges that you can uh, also utilise. And you, if you've got a rainfall uh, event that is uh, spread over a wide area, then you'd expect responses of all these to be similar. Okay, but that doesn't always happen depending upon the type of rainfall that you, that you have. So here's a comparison of two of the EA uh, gauges that I showed uh, last time. And you can see for this particular storm event in October last year, uh, the response between these two gauges is reasonably uh, similar. Um, there are variations. I mean, the peak rainfall here is three times bigger at uh, this place compared to the other, uh, even though the, uh, the spatial distance between the, the two e ga EA gauges is quite large. So, so we should <coughs> hope that all our data can be all connected to each other. Uh, when you come to um, when you come to further calculations that you've got from your particular rain, what you can do is that from your measurements, so both mine and yours will, will end up with something like this, and you can work out the total rainfall that's fallen from a particular storm by a little bit of basic maths, by looking at the uh, area under the uh, graph. So you've got an area here, so we can look at uh, basically the, splitting this up into little blocks and in a simple sense you could like just measure it uh, or you can use an Excel program or whatever but uh, it's, it's, it's relatively basic stuff to work out that total rainfall to, to, uh, to work out what's fallen in the store. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reason that uh, this is this is important in terms of comparing them is, is that you want to know whether all your rain just happens to be under a cloud over here or is it spread over a whole area. Uh, did the storm vary over time, which will affect how your um, your flow in your river 
government responds to that particular rainfall. Ideally, for me anyway, that I I like storms that are, are nicer in te intense and big, so that it covers the whole of my catchment, because then it, it resolves a lot of the uh, a lot of difficulties. Okay. What you can do though is that you can use as many gauges as pos possible to uh, derive your catchment average rainfall. So basically, you you work out. Uh, how far each gate is away from the centre of the, into the catchment and, and weight the overall uh, rain that, uh, that you can measure. So our data that, we, that we're going to uh, collect from, all, from our rainfall stations is part of a big network of gauges uh, spread throughout the UK and all these little dots here are, are daily rain gauge sites in the UK so you can see that it's quite a dense coverage Okay, so we're part of all the little dots in, in there, and we're going to be adding adding to that. Um, the the data that is represented by those graphs that I was talking about in terms of the area under the curve, you will that's the same information that you will have seen on the telly with uh, rainfall radar, where you can imagine your or you've watched these things move across the landscape. So essentially what you're seeing there is how the rainfall intensity varies spatially. So the darker, uh, the blue, the, the lighter, the rain. So this sort of, these colors are, are red is, is intense rainfall. Okay, so that is how your rainfall varies spatially, but also it varies with time as well. So our, Oh, let's see, let's see before you move that up. Yeah. Uh, it also illustrates the tremendous problem of this spatial interpolation of, of data because you'll get heavy patches, no, uh, no rain, and they're all moving through across the country. It can be a bit of a nightmare, yeah. really, but that was an illustration that I hadn't got, but I thought I'd mention it. No, that's great. Yeah. So we're tying together. So, so basically, this is so what we have from our gauges and why we need as much rainfall information as possible if you're going to describe what's happening in the catchment is that we're at at one point and you can imagine this storm let's imagine that the storm's coming this way that it will be no rain and then it will be high rain and then even higher and then it will tail across so we're here and the storm will go across like that and that's what you're seeing with with this record here so that's what's happening as your your storm passes. I'll imagine that I'm coming this way because it's easier. The storm's coming this way, and it uh, and it rises up and then drops back down again. <coughs> and what we're saying here, this is you, you can see that the spatial variation, but it's not as bad as it as it could be. It's not. It's pretty good, that really. Okay, so that's our rainfall and. This radar looks really fancy, but you still need to calibrate the radar response to standard uh, rain gauges. So the stuff that we're um, collecting, um, either by the Met Office or by ours, is important. And if I if I move back to the, the daily data, you can you can see that uh, the different gauges that I have for the EA uh, sites are reasonably comparable all right and that's both over individual days so the, that's a week but also over time but there are differences you can see that that's not the same as, as that right so this this is taking your data and averaging over a, a longer period of time uh, in this case I've gone from days to years and then I've averaged it over or it's been averaged over a number of years so it's an average response and you can see that our, our rainfall because we're driven by Atlantic weather conditions is much higher in the uh, in the west than it is on the east of the country okay. now what's going to happen is is that rainfall is going to change with uh, with the impact of climate in, in a number of different ways. That's the same information but plotted as a, as a console plot. 
Um, so, one of the things that I that we, in order to understand that, that we need to think about is how rainfall changes depending upon um, the frequency of occurrence and how long the rainstorm is. So, if I take one of these curves, it does. Uh, this examines how, for a particular likelihood of occurrence, so we call it like return period or it could be uh, one of the ways of describing this but if I, I prefer return period so it's how often something occurs on average every number of years so in this particular case is a storm that you might expect on average once every 50 years that doesn't mean that it will always occur every 50 years you might have two in a row or you might have none for 200 years but it's what occurs on average and on the bottom axis we have like duration, so storm duration, and you, on the vertical axis we have rainfall intensity. So you can see the shorter the rainfall event is, the more likely that it's going to be an intense rainfall event. If it's something that lasts uh, a long time, then it's going to be uh, a lower uh, intensity of the event, which you know from, from general experience if you're you know, wanting to go out on a, on a Sunday, it tends to rain all day. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're going between shops, you get caught between like an intense rainfall event. Do you know what I mean? So you know this. Now, the, the, two, the two curves, what you have is, is that, which is, which is common sense, is that the one that occurs more frequently tends to be a lower intensity than one that occurs infrequently. Okay, so that's why there's, there's two different lines there. Right, so what's going to happen with the impact of climate change? And uh, using uh, some work by uh, Dudson, he reckons, and his, and his mates reckon, that between now and 2080, what they reckon is, is that there's not going to be any systematic change in the total annual rainfall. So that's what you've got from your gauge summed up over the whole year uh, that's not going to change very much however there's likely to be some spatial change in rainfall so we might expect an increase in rainfall on the west coast so that bit that i showed in blue that might go up between 10 to 70 percent in that particular area that's what they think whereas in the southern part of the, uh, the uk it's going to be more dry so you might get a reduction of 6 to 65 percent so there's big ranges but generally you can see more rainfall on the west less on the, on the east and of course that does kick in in terms of water supply to growing populations in certain areas like the southeast of england crops crops mm -hmm. the yeah. so yeah uh, we also uh, uh, they also reckon that the, the maximum rainfall is going to increase and there's going to be seasonal variations, so there's going to be uh, uh, more storms expected in summer. I put here to check original data because I was trying to work out how some of the, their statements uh, work for me. Uh, if you've got like reduction of rainfall, and then you've got like more of it. But never mind, I need to check that out. Um, and in the upland areas, uh, you you expect more winter rainfall. So there's. There's an all, so overall your rainfall annually is the same in the UK but there's going to be variations uh, regionally and uh, and spate and uh, and, and, and it's also just region. chipping in again there because mm -hmm. if you are getting less rainfall in summer but you're getting a shorter intense dollop to rainfall mm -hmm. then you're getting far more runoff far more intensive erosion unless it's been retained in the landscape for other purposes. So it, you know, these are quite complicated implications, aren't they? Yeah, but well, I couldn't fit it all in for yeah, you. Know. <laughs> I think also, what you've got there, uh, top line, the global and regional models for the UK, because virtually all of this is based on modeling. physical modelling of the, the hydrological system, the climatological system, and you know, the phrase of garbage in and garbage yeah, out. Yeah. We'll have to be very careful and certain as to exactly what it is that you are uh, forecasting and I mean certainly uh, with sort of quite a, 
um, potential uh, variation uh, in terms of uh, the impact that they might have, depending on what the assumptions were to start with. That is very important to stress. Really. Yeah, it's quite. Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm not. I mean, computational work is, you know, is quite challenging. I mean, it's like it's not a, a simple task to build climate models and, oh, and run yeah. them. Horrendous. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm not. I, it's, it's it's not something that I've I've attempted, but. Like you were saying in terms of garbage in and garbage out, if you don't have good quality data or if you don't have measurements and you don't have understanding of what really is happening, then you can't you can't inform you can't inform uh, your your model. And your model is only as good as the assumptions exactly. that it makes. I mean you've seen it, it that, and that that applies to all sorts of scientific work, you know, like they think, oh, well, we think Mars is like this, but then when they get there, it, Mars isn't quite what they imagined it to be. So, so, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that actually taking measurements of a system, I mean, apart from the fact that that's what I enjoy, that, that is vitally important. How am I doing for time? Better, better run off. <laughs> Let's speed up a little bit. Uh, okay, so this is all our, our rainfall. Where, where it's applied in this particular uh, context is, um, is for the river is to do with um, the runoff. Okay, and the first thing you do, we're, we're measuring total rainfall, but it's the effective rainfall that causes the uh, the flow in the river. And the way that you get to that is by taking away your losses, and your losses are such things as infiltration, evaporation, transpiration, storage in the, in the catchment, uh, whether it's in puddles or within the river system. And it's your, I stress again, it's your effective rainfall that causes your, your runoff in your river. And, uh, and there I go, I list all the, uh, the losses that I just mentioned. Now, when you come to uh, do your calculation uh, in, for, for your storm event, what you don't do is you don't measure. You generally don't measure. Oh well, there's this amount of infiltration here, and there's this amount of evaporation from this particular uh, deciduous tree. Those are all important. But when you're when you're when you're trying to work it out in terms of your river flow, it's really it's really difficult and challenging to to measure on a on a very fine spatial uh, scale. So they tend not to be measured, and they're they're managed in bulk um, in terms of how wet your catchment is. So the reason that's important is that obviously the wetter your catchment is, then you end up with less losses and then you end up with more more runoff. And, and I mentioned most of us can remember the, uh, the flooding that happened in Boatcastle in the uh, southwest um, 20 years ago nearly now. But I, I raise that particular example because that was a, a situation where the actual storm event wasn't particularly large, but the catchment was very, very wet beforehand. So you ended up with a, a moderate event on a very wet catchment that caused that particular flood. So that's why your losses are important. Uh, when you're uh, analysing the data, talking, governed or managed by your catchment wetness index which has a number of different components. This term here is your antecedent precipitation index which uh, is a big a term that basically refers to how much rainfall occurred before the one that you're interested in. And this here, your soil moisture decimal, uh, deficit, tells you how dry your catchment is. So if there's in the summer it tends to be drier than it is in, in the winter. And that basically sucks out the water of the, from, your, from your rainfall events. What error factor have you got then in defining your catchment? Because if your catchment changes due to land use, that's going to affect the data over a long period. Yeah, so um, so your rain, your your antecedent rainfall is from your measured rainfall. Mm -hmm. So that is from my gauge or your gauge or whatever. And then this, you're right, it's a it's a bulk term. Alright. 
which fortunately for me is the responsibility of the Environment Agency. <laughs> so, so I can claim absolutely no responsibility for it whatsoever. But what... Uh, why is it not working? Right. <laughs> so this looks complicated. It's not complicated at all. It's just a load of additions, right? So you've got the rainfall the day, day before. This is your API 5. Then like the rainfall uh, on the previous day to that, and then so and so, and then you just got 0.5 rates of power. So you can all manage that, all right? <laughs> Even you, yes. <laughs> all right. So that's how that. That's how that. We can just ignore that now. But that. But that. I put that on there basically to show you how how your record of rainfall fits into into uh, into calculations. Okay. Okay, and your soil moisture deficit comes from your uh, from your Met Office, sorry, not the Environment Agency, through something called your Morex Compute Program, which is Met Office Rainfall Evaluation Calculation System. So back to your question. So what they what they it's likely that they will have done is that. They won't have the local information for your particular catchment area in the Lindbrook. It will be some average value depending upon altitude and geographical location. So it won't be at a fine level of detail, I imagine. Right, so I, 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 I can't promise that that statement is true, but I reckon that's probably likely. And of course, that's where it gets complicated again if you've got very clay soil. Or you've got, say, like the limber where the woodlands has caused the topsoil to run up to be eroded, and all you've got is a clay subsoil. Because in the dry period, that sets like concrete. And then water just runs straight, it isn't absorbed, it just runs straight up. I would have thought soil would be in there. I would have thought the, the ge because the geology of the soil, topsoil, you know, depth of soil is, is reasonably well mapped, but it won't be. I can't imagine that the you know they won't it won't be on a crop basis and it won't be I can't imagine that they'll say that the tr different trees will be there won't be a cover element in this mm -hmm. I don't think I'll, I'll look it up the next time okay so the reason this is important is is that when you've got a storm event it allows you to, and your rainfall that you're, you're associating with that particular change in discharge in the river. You're, you've got your rainfall and then you get, you're going to go, well, how much of that rainfall is lost and how much, you know, it's a more sophisticated way of managing the rainfall that drives the, um, drives the flow in the river. Okay, so this is what causes your your flow in your river, so you get your total rainfall, you've got your losses, right, and then you take your losses away from your total rainfall to give you effective rainfall. Now that effective rainfall falls over a particular catchment area, and your catchment area is based uh, upon the topography of the river, so you can, you've all walked in the hills and walked along a ridge right line, and you can imagine if there's a cloud that happens to be following you around, that some of the water flows off to the left hand side and some of it flows off to the right and it's the same principle that's used to establish your your catchment area i still do mine by hand there's plenty of um, computer programs that do it uh, digitally but but i find my my hand method is normally more accurate than the uh, than the computer one okay and you can easily visualize that your catchment can be split up into a number of small catchments just by thinking about a river and its tributaries so that falls into that and etc etc now the key variables that govern the response of the uh, uh, response of the river to rainfall within a particular catchment are the length of the stream, so if you've got the, the Thames, you can imagine that's a lot longer than the Lynbrook. Uh, 
you've got how steep it is. So if you've got very steep catchment, it's going to water's going to flow off very quickly. And cover, in particular, uh, urbanisation. So they've proven that there's a statistical relationship or impact of urbanisation. However, they've not been able to deduce a sort of like more um, natural variations, as in like fields versus. Uh, forest but I think that's not because they don't cause a difference it's because the various aspects are sort of intermingled within the flow of the river and they've not been able to separate them out certainly if you measure the runoff from the field with mole drainage and no uh, drainage at all then the, 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 the runoff it does vary so therefore one presumes that on a larger scale, the, there is an impact, but as I said, it gets, it gets lost. Okay. But that's one thing that the government is now um, putting into its calculations, and uh, they're going to be paying out money on quite a large scale, just on the basis of uh, how you manage the, uh, uh, the land, no. the, the arable land, uh, or pasture land, uh, to uh, slow down any movement of water and down into the river. Yeah, so they know they know it has an impact. But what I would say, if you if you were trying to predict the outflow from a particular catchment, currently it's difficult for them to go. Well, if you've got like ten percent of of this crop, or twenty percent woodland, or or whatever, if you try to delve more deeply into description of your particular catchment. The, the farmers themselves are now delving into it. Oh, they uh, 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 Farmers leap it down as far as uh, uh, jumping on the bandwagon of regenerative agriculture and going on to something I've never even come across before. They've come up with their own title of transition. Uh, how we used to farm and the, the transition in all these different ways into how we will be farming when the government has worked out what sort of subsidies they're going to pay, pay us for this, that, and the other. Well, yeah, because at the end of the day, like it, you know, like it's a, it's actually quite cost effective, cost effective to manage your water in an upland area than trying to manage it once it's flooded people's houses. You know, it's, that's that's where you need to. It's it's, it's a sensible way of managing your water. There's been an awful lot of uh, payment for drainage for agricultural. Now we almost do the opposite. Please can you make sure you hold on to that water for longer. Well, I guess it depends. I mean, obviously, the original uh, reason for draining land is to, to in, increase like crop production. So, if it is, exactly. Anyway, I'm aware that I better. Yeah. So, um, so you've got various. Um, this response of runoff uh, sits upon the existing base flow in, in the river. So, this is the base flow of a small stream down at this particular part. Um, and that's going to be different to a whole catchment and then this is like base flow plus a storm event down at down the bridge um, and what you have is that this flow if you uh, with your measurement um, either manually or if you're measuring it continuously is the storm event gives you a change in discharge with time uh, which is calculated from um, from both your depths and velocities and ultimately what you want is that you're wanting to look at uh, how your how your river responds to a particular rain event and any intervention what we're trying to do then is basically slow down the uh, the occurrence of of your your peak uh, peak discharge in a particular river. Um, the rest, of, I'm aware of time, so I'm quite happy to, to wind up at this particular part. But the things that, that you're that you're measuring in the river are your your flow depth, and you combine your depth with your how your area uh, ch changes in your river depending upon the flow depth. So some are rectangular channels, some are trapezoidal. So the bigger the bigger the, uh, the bigger the, the width compared to the depth. Um, is good because it slows down your velocity. So your velocity is also another aspect that you need to consider if you're going to get a, a discharge. Uh, it's not just how your depth varies, it's, it's your flow as well. Um, and 
and here I talk about how you would take that uh, that particular data and uh, combine it with the uh, with the velocity to get you your your discharge. And you can, if you have a flow gauging station, then it allows you to get rid of velocity and you can just measure depth. So that's the purpose of weirs that you see here in rivers. Um, and then hopefully what you've got at the very end, if you've got, this is your base flow here, and this is your storm event. If you take away your base flow, then this is your runoff here. And if I, if I calculated the area again, then that should be the same as your, uh, if I take my area under here, that gives you a volume. And then if I take my effective rainfall and I multiply it by the catchment area, then the two things should be the same. Now, obviously we've lost uh, rainfall, um, and that can be described by something called percentage runoff. And you want your percentage runoff to be as low as possible. So you want your, your losses to be as large as they can be, because that means that your runoff is then appropriately smaller. So to conclude, right, you want to maximise your losses to reduce your effective rainfall and hence your runoff. The key, key parameters that are your rainfall uh, that we're uh, measuring. Your catchment uh, characteristics are very important and these will end up informing your discharge in your river and how it responds to particular rainfall. And from your river discharge, the key parameters that we'll just look at are your time to peak and then also your peak discharge. But in the absence of flow measurement gauging stations, the peak discharge is harder to quantify exactly. Okay. So at that point, I'm sorry if I've overrun a little bit, so I shall uh, I'll draw it to a close. And that was pitched at roughly the right yeah. end. Well, what you'll be doing is taking a sort of an individual point uh, where you'll be recording weather. Uh, and this is the most common way we do it. But I should just mention that um, with satellites on a rather different scale, you can get aerial patterns. And as we saw on the screen of the radar, which I uh, wanted uh, Kevin to uh, display, you could see the spatial patterns of the instantaneous weather at that time, uh, rather than just a sort of a, a global average. So. Um, Another question we might do is, when do we record this? Uh, is it a certain time of day, or is it continuity? And in the early days of weather recording, um, it was often done by uh, private individuals, uh, interested amateurs, and you then had one of their servants going to read the, the weather station at nine o'clock in the morning because that was a convenient time for getting up and doing your measurements <clears throat> and so historically the Met Office still do use nine o'clock for many weather readings unfortunately um, the type of electronic systems that you have here and especially as many of them are based on American examples you will find that the day is 12 midnight to 12 midnight so any data you get from it will refer to that calendar day from midnight to midnight. But if you try and compare your readings, driven by this, with the museum, for example, you'll find that for things like rainfall and sometimes even temperature, you don't get true correspondence because you've got a different time period. So it's just something to be aware of when one's trying to make interpretations of these things and comparing with uh, the work that Kev was mentioning. Uh, <coughs> it's sometimes varying as to what you're dealing with. Now what about location? Now, I'm not quite sure as to exactly where you would hope to locate yours. Probably the bottom of the park in the garden of the lodge. Oh, down there, yeah, okay. Um, well, sighting is extremely important because 
if you're just dealing with one particular point, you've got all the factors that will affect the weather yeah, I'm just hearing about, and the climate of that area. For example, <coughs> what influences what you'll be measuring? Well, on the handout that you've got uh, in front of you, uh, I started with local factors and possibly one of the dominant ones is, is the local topography, the shape of the land surface. And so we have the valley form, how uh, what the gradients of the, the valley sides are. Is the wind likely to be channeled down the valley? Um, <coughs> are we likely to get cold air accumulating? Because when the um, the wind flow is uh, weak, cold air would be denser, will tend to flow down the valley sides and perhaps accumulate at the valley bottom or wherever it can, like a natural dam where sometimes you get to forest or walls even across the, uh, the, uh, the location. So these are the things that one uh, has to consider. And Lastly, but no means least in terms of the topography, the aspect, the shape of the valley, which way it's facing, um, all very local factors. Something we've also been uh, hearing about is the vegetation around it. Uh, what type, what height of the trees that uh, you're dealing with. Uh, now, I know you've got plenty of woods, sometimes ancient woodlands, uh, sometimes just large plantations. But <coughs> Depending how far your site is from any of these uh, obstructions to the airflow and to the energy balance, this will have an impact on the temperatures you receive. Uh, we've also heard about soil factor. If it's a wet soil, it'll have different thermal properties from a dry sandy soil. And so uh, that is also very important. And another thing that has also been mentioned are buildings themselves. Uh, how far away from buildings are uh, now you've mentioned you don't want too far because you've got to have uh, power supplies or uh, radio contact between the site and your recording because you can't have the, uh, the console outside. Um, and this is very important. Uh, this particular site I have in my garden is not a standard site because it's between two houses with a patch of garden and therefore in winter when the sun has a relatively low trajectory through the sky it doesn't get any direct sunlight flying on the weather station until about three o'clock in the afternoon whereas in summer it's getting up to about six degrees in the sky oh, from about ten o'clock you'll have sun falling on the uh, on weather station and it does have quite a difference. I can see when I'm <coughs> looking at my observations that when the shadow moves off the script of the set, uh, weather station, it often shows by a couple of degrees. Even though the, the sensors are shielded from the direct rays of the sun, the impact that the sun has on the ground, warm air rising up, does have quite a, a strong effect. And just as a, another illustration of this, um, I share my data with a friend of mine who lives in Holmesfield. Well, for those of you who know Holmesfield, it's a god the same spot nearly a thousand feet above sea level. <coughs> a very windy and exposed site. Not far from the Angel Pub, if you know the area. And yet, quite often, especially in winter, his maximum temperatures are higher than mine. Even though there's probably a 200 meter, uh, yeah, um, 100 meter difference between, which should generate a sort of lower temperature. So I get the data from the museum, from Homesfield and my own, and I see how uh, they do vary. And I'm afraid they do vary for these varieties of reasons that we've had. Um, in terms of sighting, another important thing is the height above the ground surface. Kev showed the, uh, the uh, almost ground level gauge at um, uh, the uh, Abbeydale railway uh, site and ideally what you want, especially for hydrological purposes, is how much rain is actually getting onto the ground surface. Well, 
if you put a radiator right on the ground surface, then you get spotting in. So you get more than you really should be from that particular location. Um, so you want to put the gauge a little bit above the ground so that it doesn't spot in. But of course that then affects the airflow of the gauge and how much we'll actually get into it. Um, snow, <coughs> another nightmare of hydrology, and hydrology. It doesn't always uh, accumulate around the gauge or in the gauge. And so it's very much a, sort of a myster mysterious element of snowfall. But it's a much of bouncy <coughs> how high above the ground you should have your gauge to get a representative value of what's going on. And I brought a, a little book called British Rainfall 1892 with me, which just demonstrated this as a problem in the early days when we were standardisation. And the height above the ground surface varied from about six inches up to 15 feet, because sometimes it's stuck on top of buildings, which doesn't affect how much of the art. Now, my, my rain gauge is about one and a half meters above the ground, largely because of the um, height of the pole that I have. And just sort of practical elements of assembling it, the pole does tend to vibrate in strong winds, and it can save your little buckets and uh, get spurious readings in strong gales. Uh, so do be careful when sighting this to sort of what, what height you want to be. And it's particularly important if you then want to compare it with other sites like the environment agencies ones near Um Can you actually measure the angle at which the rain is coming down? Oh yes! <laughs> Again, if you live at Homesfield and the wind's going that way uh, with the rain, not as much comes into the gauge uh, as if it's sort of a, a torrential downpour. Uh, so yes, that is important too. Uh, and it is noticeable when I'm just comparing my two um, gauges or how to gauge it. And of course, when it's snowing, that's even worse because that's lighter. And so it's likely to... Um, get carried away and not, um, not uh, uh, be caught by the cage. Um, <coughs> in Britain, the standard height is supposed to be 1.2 metres above the ground surface for the centres. You, you might have seen white wooden boxes with movers which are called Stevenson screens. Mm -hmm. And this was a standard which was supposed to give you uh, ventilation of air through the weather station. Um, and shielding from the direct rays of the sun so that you really were measuring uh, the weather. Admittedly, 1.2 meters above the ground rather than at the surface. So, like all data, you've really got to know what you're comparing with what when you see uh, what sort of spatial variations you're getting. Now, um, I think those are the main things that I, I wanted to stress. Uh, when you sight your gauge, it's really it dependent on what purpose you want to use it. Uh, now, you're not going to be getting into the scale of putting it as part of your climate change. As uh, Kev said, you normally have um, sort of 30-year averages for this, and um, it's going to take a long time. And you need to have it at a site which allows you to compare those nearby. So. Um, as far as possible, you can cite it somewhere that's fulfilling these requirements of a standard site that, that allows then you to compare it with other people's data and other people to use yours as well. And so I wish you luck. I found mine being very reliable so far. Uh, I've about 12, 13 years of it now. And, um, the Huntsfield site as well has survived even longer in, uh, uh, in the uh, more extreme climate that they experience. But, um, but then you are open to quite strong western and, winds. And also, if you're sticking it on the chimney top, uh, it affects the temperature, you're further away from the yeah, ground, and, uh, it affects the rainfall, which is yeah, then yeah. less uh, able to be caught, and of course the wind tends to increase with height which counteracts the, uh, the, the rainfall amount that you might get. 
So it's not an ideal. Sounds as though you don't need to go to it then uh, very often. Once you've installed it, it's there and oh, yes, you yeah. don't actually have to go and fit it in. Well, hopefully not, no. Oh. It, it does require a bit of cleaning once a year and uh, battery change occasionally. Oh. So if you have it in one place, you'll get it in the six of the same place. Yeah. 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 Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, he, he did put um, his weather station on the chimney, partly because of security, he lived in near Firth Park. And, uh, Should we be notifying anybody that we've got it? Um, It depends what you want to do with the data. I mean, if you think that the data would be useful to them, then by all means, um, you could let the Met Office know, but because you probably won't be in a standard size of the Lim uh, house or the Lane, um, they may not be so interested. And as I said, there is always this problem with the Met Office and the time scale uh, of, of observations at midnight or 9 a.m. Mm. Oh, humidity, yeah. Um, it's funny you should say that, because I thought perhaps I should check. Um, the temperature is a thermistor. It's sort of a, a, chemical, uh, a metal junction which sort of records uh, different currents developed by different temperatures. Um, humidity, normally in a screen it used to be wet and dry bulb thermometers. And I know it's not now because... Oh yes, they were, completely. I have found this one work very well. When, when it's foggy and saturated, it's about 98%. Um, it has it down to about 20, 30% as the lowest values. But I'm not quite certain exactly how this machine uh, operates to work out the humidity. It was one of the things I thought I must do before I go. So right. the key thing really for the group, the group is going to be deciding where we actually place this. That I think is your key issue. Um, so and whether you really just want to see what is just the value itself. So the Met Office site has the recommendations. Yeah. That would tell you where to sign it. Yeah. 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 It's conflicting though because like rain gauges, rain gauges like we were talking before. Like, Ideally, they're at ground level, so that's what that, that grid is for. And then they realise that that's not always appropriate, so they went for 12 inches above the rims. 12 yeah, inches. I didn't mention the diameter of the rim. Or, yeah. And then, like the, and then you enclose it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pounds field, sort of like in the back. But plainly, if you're measuring everything all in one place, then you can't, you can't have. If it's right down here, then you've got going to get no wind. And then I know from standard measurement of wind, they used to like it, you know, 10 metres in the... Yeah, well, I just said to Christine, uh, in fact, I put it on here, that so the standard is 10 metres. For, for a, what we call a synoptic scale, the, the larger scale of, of uh, weather measurement. Mm -hmm. So it's different, so it's all, it's all compromises. And then, like, you've got your, like, well, with rainfall, you've got rain shadow, so you'll get the same thing with wind, I guess, so if you put in... You know, if you put it next to a building, then your wind will be affected by. So it's a balance, and then like you'd want to put it somewhere where it's not going to get stolen. The least of a variety of evils. <laughs> so you've got a, you'll have your checklist, and I guess it's all about it's all about trying to compromise. I mean, it wants to be accessible, so somebody might have a garden that's that's you know suitable, but then then, you know, do they want people traipsing in and out of their right. garden? Yeah. Accessible and secure as well. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the, the water monitoring particularly, presumably, the higher up the catchment, the more informative it is for what we're doing with the stream. Well, it depends what, what you want it for. I mean, ideally, you put it in the centroid of the area, so like where you know, the, the middle point mm. of, the, of the whole of the catchment, that, that give, which is around about Whirlow or as mm. it happens. So... But if you put it on the roof, on a flat roof at Whirlow, yeah. 
you'd get consistent data and it would have all these anomalies from that. But that would be secure mm. and it would be consistent. Mm. That's on the offshore bit as well though. Yeah, yeah. that's the obvious yeah. place yeah. To, to put it where it's not going to be vandalised. That's a very important thing a, really, yeah. Mm. A big issue. And if we're going to use it really for just getting some comparative data and to educate people about how web stations work. Well, this is uh, Kev's point about compromise. Yeah, it, yes. that, I think that might be a, mm. a possibility. Um, and the Wi Fi, possibly maybe better. Mm. Okay. Oh, sure, yeah. As long as it can get through the stove. Maybe we can talk about <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't been up on the roof to look. Um, maybe we need to talk but then it loses its value in comparing with say the museum if that's yeah, what you wanted yeah. to do but you're by the sound of it that's not going to be really be practical it's, anyway it's, not, I don't it's think so. an amateur very amateurish mm. system and, uh, if it's in one because obviously you in the old days we used to put the water yeah. yes, yeah. down there the wind turbine measuring on the long yeah, pole yeah. and then your old white box Yep. The yes. See, we're all too old. We always mm. re all remember that system. A <laughs> <laughs> modern one. But, but some date is better than no date. Yeah, that, that's fine. Well, yes, yeah. yeah. So. And if you, if you know what the um, variables are, yeah. then if you're a little bit sophisticated, you can start to. So you know, like, like you were saying about your comparison between oh, your, yes, yes, your yes, friends yes, yes, and yes, yes, yours, yes. and then if you know that it's a consistent difference, or you know, when you've measured yeah. it a little bit over time, you can actually do some corrections for some of that. We could probably even you know, ask Peter if he could have yeah. some of what he's got that you can compare it's when you're on the other side of the valley. If it's indicative trends, really, yeah, isn't it's it? the and, indicative uh, trends, yeah. You know, if you've got a 5% error factor, as yeah. long as you've always got a 5% error, error factor, factor yeah. then you know, if you know you, that is, yeah. you can build, We've all you tried can build that, that, yeah. build that in. So I mean, some of us think that way, we say, you know, like, it's plus or minus, yeah. what was it, 60%, 60% to 90%, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, that's a pretty large error factor, yeah. yeah. You know, things, depends on how, it really depends on what you want the, what you want the station to do. I mean, I would say, I would say that, I mean, I've lost, I mean, you, I've lost kit in the field, so you, you know, so you, you have to bear in mind that it will either if it's like natural disasters or or like human induced sort of like disasters where there are people thieving not got much or or curiosity shall we say you know like so you have to be you have to think about that and then think well if i if i if i compromise if i make the best compromise that i can that i don't lose my kit and then i think well well, what does that tell me? I mean, you can go, well, that in some ways it allows other people to get involved. So you could go, like, well, I'll, I'll have like I'll have a handheld device that gives me sort of like wind temperature and, and direction that allows me to compare a particular location to my, to my standard site, or I compare my rain gauge at the railway to your one, or you have everybody thinks well i'm going to put a, a bucket in my back garden and measure my total rainfall you know on a daily basis and then think oh well look, that i'll see how that compares to to my gauge so it, it there's lots of different possibilities you can't measure you, you can't have like rain gauges at like half k intervals across the whole side. Do you know what I mean? Well, you usually have the whole country coming up with a membrane. It all goes in the enormous totalism. But then the runoff would be effect, really, a quite a store. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah. Nothing to go in the river because we've collected it all. So I don't know. It's up to you, really. What do you think? Well, I think we need to do it in stages. We need to learn how this works mm -hmm. and understand that. Yeah, I mean, that is relatively straightforward. And then, you know, we need to right? It's the sighting of it. Yeah, and then the Once we've chosen the site, we can't be moving it now. No, no, no. But we need to know how it works. And yeah. then when we put it out, it's working properly. Oh, yeah. Um, 
I mean, certainly there's an argument for, for sharing it out to begin with, in that, you know, like, there's nothing, <laughs> if it's in, you know, providing your gardens are fairly safe, then, like, there's nothing to be having the thing in your garden and, and seeing how it works and saying, oh, well, I, right, I can see this and yeah. this is the output and then, and then, you know, you all then get some experience of, of the actual gauge because otherwise it's like, oh, well, Plastic. So he knows about that. <laughs> Just as a query, um, what's the software with that? Do you have to manually extract it from the machine, or does it log it and store it? And I think it's supposed to log it and store it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that we have to then get. So you can have it at the co on the console and verify data transmission, and that's where the Wi-Fi. Thing comes in. If it's near enough to the Wi-Fi, then it can do it over the Wi-Fi. Why I ask is because if it, if, it, if it also says on things that you could download it, there's an app that you can mm -hmm. download and then you can put it onto the app, yes. or you can put it onto the console and then USB it off yeah. onto your laptop. Well, when I had mine, I, I bought the cheaper version mm -hmm. and that sort of provides the data on the console, which you can download for up to a month, yeah. I think it says. But for about another £200, which was almost 100% of the original cost, you could get the software, which allowed you to sort of analyse it and interpret it. But I haven't run to it in those days, so I wasn't sure uh, what you got with yours. Because otherwise it means someone's got to just make a note of it and then perhaps input that data to some other sort of... So ideally you'd have the software that does it automatically. Yeah. 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 But I think we just have to investigate it. Mm. And there's a piece of kit, it's not that big and it's not that intrusive. No. So if we can find a, a good place to locate it, then that would be helpful. And at least it then gives us some in-situ insight into what's actually happening in the park. It's for you, really, and then like, yeah. and then like, if other people are interested in, yeah. let's say somebody's, you know, interested in like the flora and fauna of, of your area, then they they might say, oh, well, what else have we got? But it's sort of like, mm -hmm. I think, the, I would say the primary. I mean, I'm interested because because obviously, if I end up with a problem, well, the more the more information you have. Then the the better it is, you know. If you lose data or you you think, oh well, why is my why have I got a particular response in the river? Why is it so? And you think, oh well, that's actually because my rainstorm went from you know south to north, and that's why it behaved in a particularly different way. Or if, if my percentage runoff is weird, it might be, oh well, it only rained in a part of the catchment and not in the other. So it's it's useful to have, um, but I think I think I would say that it's it's your it, it's for you to generate your interest and your knowledge, and you think oh well I, I see that's what it does. So I mean, what you what might get it would be a, an undergraduate project student or an MSc project student who might want to look at uh, data. Comparing the sort of stuff that Kevin's already been getting, maybe with what you're getting. So it's worth actually flagging that up. Because students, you know, they do do projects. But if students do projects, they have to kind of go out and Absolutely. do the projects. Certainly that's correct. the thing. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's where you that might, might get somebody. Be, uh, and, you know, if you say we've got this data, we can stream it to you and use it if you want. That's why we need the other teach Not the old one. Yeah. I know when I went to, I happened to be in the high green area on the chart board and, and there happened to be a school party there and they they were quite interested yeah. in what I was doing but I, maybe it just so happened that it, as you say, it fitted in with what they were doing. I think there can be interest. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks to everybody. We need to put this back in the box. Yeah. On, on, on many different levels. <laughs> 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 <laughs>